I guess we're here to talk about Grid. Um, I'm Christina Costello. I'm a developer at Redfin Solutions in Portland, Maine. I've been there for about three years doing Drupal. Um, I do front-end and back-end development, so could be in a given day writing my SQL queries and then writing Grid SaaS stuff. So, um, which I like. I like it like that. A little louder. Really hard to hear. Okay. All right. So I'll try to enunciate for you. Um, so Grid has been out for two years, about. Uh, came out in the spring of 2017, I believe, in, a, um, in most major browsers, modern browsers. Um, and it was really pretty revolutionary in that most other layout methods were pretty much hacks um, when you think about it. When you start using Grid, they start to feel way more like hacks than they ever did before. Um, the history of layout, you know, like just the document flow, tables, floats, um, Flexbox helped out a lot, but still had um, a lot of things you couldn't do with it that Grid really helps out with. And this line at the bottom, um, that Grid is one of the most powerful CSS modules ever introduced. I, you know, those were kind of just words to me before I started using Grid and playing with it and exploring it and reading documentation and going to workshops and. Um, now I totally buy it. It's super powerful and really flexible and even fun to use. Um, there are just a couple concepts to get your head around, so um, hopefully we can just cover some of the main features and you can, over the course of some examples, see how powerful this thing really is. Obviously I'm not going to cover all of its features or all of its details, but a um, little kind of crash course to help you get uh, more comfortable with it. Because um, I went to, so my company hadn't been using Grid in production until pretty recently. And I went to Generate Conf in New York in April, and people there were still really hesitant to use Grid. Um, people have a lot of different reasons for that, and I'm super interested in those reasons. Um, and just last week, the State of CSS 2019 survey came out, and this is the graphic they provided that uh, shows, so the one with a lot of blue and a little bit of teal is Flexbox. So you can see how far we've come there. But Grid has this sort of half of people aren't using it still, haven't even really tried it. And um, kind of, you know, I've heard different reasons and hopefully whatever your reasons are, you feel a little bit more comfortable using it after this talk. That's my goal. Um, so. Again, don't worry so much about the syntax right now, just some major concepts and um, get to be familiar with it is just the idea. So, um, so just some terminology so we can talk about grid. Um, a lot of it is conceptually similar to not tables for layout, but just table, columns, rows, cells. Um, so the container is the outermost element that gets the grid layout. Um, you put display grid on a container and its items, the direct children of that container, fall into the grid layout. Um, a grid cell is a one by one unit on the grid. A grid area is when you have more than one cell. Um, so items can span multiple cells. A row would be in, the, in a horizontal writing mode, the inline axis, right? Just like tables and columns are the vertical block axis. A track. Um, it's just a row or a column. It's just a handy way to refer to both. A grid line is um, just the divisions between cells and tracks. Um, they, it includes the perimeter lines, and that starts to kind of throw people off a little bit. Um, you'll see why. But uh, they're indexed starting at 1, and you can use negative numbers to count backwards from the end of an explicit grid. We'll talk about that, too. Um, Gaps is the, the gutters, the space between tracks. You can't put content there. Uh, if you find yourself trying to put content in a gap, you should have just made another track, basically. Um, and another, so a concept that came along with Grid that can be a little tricky for some people is there's this idea of what's explicitly defined about the grid and what's implicitly created by the browser. So anything that you'd refer to as the explicit grid that you've created is when you've defined the number and size of its tracks. An implicit grid is when the browser has started to take over and create tracks for you. Um, which turns out to be really powerful when you start to let go of control a little bit and lean into 
the discomfort and let the browser do a lot of the hard heavy lifting for you. Um, so some of the fun, fun functions and keywords and things like that that you can use to define your grids include, uh, I'm going to run through a few of these pretty quickly um, with some code pen examples. And let me know if you can't see these. I'll try to keep them pretty big. Um, so this container, you can see I just have a container with some items in it. Um, display grid is on the container, so all of the items inside are grid items. I've defined a gap just so you can see the distinction between different cells. Um, and then I'm defining the columns with this grid template columns property. And I just have fixed values saying that I want six columns that are 100 pixels wide. Um, better than that would be using the FR unit, which stands for fraction, essentially. So the browser will start doing a lot of the math for you to make it just take up the available space. Because these are all set to one FR, they'll get even distribution of space. Um, better than that would be saying repeat. Um, repeat is like I have here, um, you just write the number of times you want something to repeat and then literally what you want to repeat. Um, so here I'm saying I want six tracks that take up one fraction of the space, right? Um, you can start doing things like repeat the expression 1FR, 2FR three times. You can see you can start to play with that and get more interesting layouts right off the bat with just this one. Uh, function that you can throw in grid template columns or grid template rows. It's how you define tracks on the column or row. Um, let's see. Min max. So this is just setting a minimum size for a track and a maximum size for a track. Hopefully this is big enough. Um, let's see. So here, item one can be as small as 100 pixels and as large as 200 pixels. And based on the viewport width, it'll figure out how much space it should take up out of that allowed range. Um, and I just have the three columns defined with min max, just to show a super simple example of how you could play with that. They will shrink down to their minimums and then start to cause an overflow because I've used fixed pixel values, um, which so far, so far from what you've seen, you might think that you're going to end up having to write a lot of media queries, and I'll show you some ways around that. Um, in, in general, you should, once you start getting comfortable with Grid, find that you're using way fewer media queries. And I'll have some examples of that. Stop doing that. There we go. Okay. Uh, span. So one way to place items on your Grid is to specify the line numbers that you want an item to start and stop at. So if you want something to span two columns, you can say start at column one, or line one, end at line three, right? So grid column, item A is placed from line one to line three. And what's super helpful, and the reason why I'm in Firefox, is we have the grid inspector is really powerful in Firefox. Let me see if I can get that to be a red. No, that's the wrong one. There we go. I want you to be red. So you can see that a little bit better now. There's a line starting at the um, leftmost edge of the grid that I've defined, a line cutting through item one, a line at three, and one at the end that's four and negative one. Handy. Um, you'll see some examples of that. The same thing is saying one to three for line placement. You could say start at one, but span two. The span keyword, so it stays in the same place, it doesn't move, it does the same thing. The span keyword is just gonna be handy if you don't know the number of items that are gonna be in your grid. So you can see that there's this whole world of when you have an unknown number of items where that, cut, that implicit grid, where the browser creates tracks for you is gonna come in handy. Um, you can do things like item six here, is starting at line two and ending at negative one, so it's anchored to the end of the grid I've defined. Um, it can start it to span two, it can span two, end at negative one. These will all do the same thing. They're just different ways of placing things by line number and using the span keyword. 
Box alignment, if you're familiar with Flexbox, it's pretty similar. You have justify and align items and self. Justify being the inline axis and um, align being the block axis. The default is stretch, similar to Flexbox. Um, that's just so I have some items here. They're all each, so I've nested grids inside each item here. Um, they're, they have display grid, align item, center, justify item, center. If I do align items end, everything should pop to the bottom of the vertical axis. If I justify items end, everything should go to the end of its inline axis within that grid. So if you want something perfectly centered inside of its container, just display grid, align item center, justify item center, and you're ready to go. It's always going to be in the center. Pretty um, straightforward way of doing that, which has historically been a really difficult thing to do with CSS. Um, let's see. Content fit is another thing that starts to come into play with grid. Um, min content, so if you have a div with text in it, min content will shrink that div to the size of the longest word in the text, for example. Max content will run that text out as far as it has room. And fit content will allow you to, it's basically max content with a maximum size on it. It's kind of like min max where there's a size it's clamped at, it stops at the value you've defined as its max. So here's min content, all those twos, it's just gonna be the width of the smallest value in there, which is a two. Max content, those twos should run out the course of how many there are. So now that track is taking up that much space. If I use fit content, they'll grow until 200 pixels and stop. Autofill and auto fit, also really useful. Um, can be really confusing at first because they, at certain viewport widths, appear to do the exact same thing. Um, autofill, so the browser will add as many columns as will fit, for example, in a row. And if it runs out of items to place in each uh, column, it'll just keep adding columns and those columns will take up space. Auto fit will also keep adding columns, but it'll collapse the empty ones. So that one you definitely need to see an example of. Um, so let's see. The first one is auto fill. And you have to see that in the grid inspector, there is, um, see how many lines we're getting? How many empty, just based on the width of the viewport, it's allowing that many extra columns to exist. Um, whereas the auto fit should have the same exact number of lines, but they're all collapsed at the end. Let's see if this will play nicely with it. It's a little, little buggy sometimes when you have multiple grids on a page, but uh, there, seven, eight, nine, it'll have the exact same number as the top row, 12, 13, 14, 15. Uh, this, we should say 15 right here, they're just collapsed. So that's used in the repeat function as the first <coughs> parameter. So autofill or autofit with min max allows you to lay things out. Um, and so you might think, why would I ever want to use autofill if it's going to leave all that empty space? It's actually really handy for sm small examples where you might want to uh, pop an item to the end like that by placing it with grid column end negative one. You can imagine maybe like there's a scrubber in the middle and you have some buttons on the left, buttons on the right. You can imagine probably a lot of uses for that. It's a pretty cool thing, I think. Like a pager? Yeah, something like that. Um, there's another way besides grid template columns and grid template rows to place items and define uh, areas on your grid, which is with grid template areas and use grid area to place them. So I'll show you an example of that. That is done literally just by writing out some pretty arbitrary names for what you want your tracks to be called. So here I have header, 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 sidebar first, content, sidebar second, footer, footer, footer. And by just saying grid area header, A is now going to take up that whole first row. 
Sidebars are placed on the side and footers spanning the bottom row. It just says grid area sidebar first, grid area content, grid area sidebar second, and footer. Uh, you can do some fun stuff. So here's, say, an extra div that I want to overlay the second row. That I can say grid row start at line two, run to line three. And in the columns, run from line one to line negative one. But what naming my areas actually did was it named my lines for me. I could, instead of saying negative one to negative one, I could say sidebar first start to sidebar second end. And it works the other way around too. If I name my lines, it'll give me implicitly named areas that I could place things into. They wrote some pretty cool stuff into this specification and I think that's one of them. Um, I think this is the last one I'm gonna show. Uh, there's more to talk about, but for just examples of what grid can do. <coughs> The auto flow, so you're getting the idea now that there's this auto placement algorithm. It will take your items and lay them out in the grid one by one cell at a time, one by one for you. Uh, the default value is row. So it'll start filling the rows first, moving to a new column as needed. Column will fill the columns first, moving to new uh, rows. No, will fill, uh, yeah, so the other way around. I just wrote columns twice. Um, dense will actually, if a smaller item is encountered later that would fit into a hole that was left earlier in the grid, it'll throw it back in that empty space. So here you can see the default being row looks like this, which if I change auto flow row, shouldn't change anything, it's the same, but column, Two is now underneath one, and then three, and then four, and then five. Six is told to span multiple rows, so it didn't fit underneath five, so it's on a new, it's in a new column. But see how seven and eight could have fit in that space left under the five? If you set column dense, they pop in in that empty space that was left. A lot of interesting things you could do with layout with this, for example. You can imagine image galleries um, as an example. So, things that were kind of like aha moments for me or made a lot of that, those were really nuts and bolts features of Grid, but stuff that really helped me get my head around this was, first of all, that Grid Inspector in Firefox is really powerful. Um, it's, like you saw, you can change the color of your grid lines. It shows you where your explicit grid ends and your implicit grid ends. Um, it has, you can show, where grids are nested, it's just a lot easier to reason about your grid once you have uh, those lines on the page for you. Uh, so another thing is that you can now start using a lot less elements that are for layout purposes only and really focus on semantic accessible markup and use grid to lay things out in a smart way. Um, instead of screwing with your markup so much to get your layout to work, which we're really used to doing from other layout methods. Counting the lines instead of the tracks will get you a bit farther <coughs> as well when you're planning a grid. Um, Jen Simmons has been going around doing this thing <laughs> that's really fun, where she gets handed a layout as she goes on stage from just a magazine or some book, and she'll code the grid live on stage, and the first thing she does is open an image of it in any photo editing or design software and draws grids on where all the content, grid lines on where all of the content needs to start and stop. Instead of saying what we're used to from grid frameworks, um, like I have a 12 column grid and that's all I get and everything has to adhere to that 12 column grid, right? Um, and also thinking about grid in terms of components instead of pages. Again, it's different from the traditional grid frameworks that we've been using like Bootstrap and 960 and those um, were really useful at the time, but they should start falling away and you definitely shouldn't see people using grid to create grid frameworks. Uh, you can do this at the component level like I was doing with those items that were nested and centering them within their cell on the grid. You can do little layout 
features with Grid. Don't worry, you don't have to worry about setting one layout for your whole page. Everything has to live by that layout. It doesn't really work like that. It doesn't have to. Um, percentages, you're going to start using less and less because there's the, the FR unit is really great at distributing items in space. It's fluid. The math is always perfect because the computer is doing it, not you, not some framework. It's really legible. One fraction just means one fraction of the space. And uh, it will account for the gutters, right? So that's always been a problem where you have to make everything add up to 100%, all your columns and your gutters. And what if you need to change your gutter size and you got to redo all the math? It's just uh, that starts falling away as an issue. Millions of media queries to change your layout every step of the way. Uh, that should start falling away as you use grid more. You can start leaning into that layout algorithm and letting it do the work for you. Uh, especially for us with uh, CMS where we don't know the amount or size of the content in advance. Uh, so you see I, in all those examples just did grid template columns. It'll create rows implicitly in that case. I didn't have to specify how many rows I wanted. Items if they run out of space will just wrap to a new row. And I have an example of that. So here are a bunch of angry cats. All it is is repeat auto fit min max 201 FR, which looks like a lot at first if you've never seen those keywords before. But all that really amounts to is without a single media query on this page, I'm going to get cats, cats, cats all the way down until there's just one cat stacked. No media queries. How cool is that? <laughs> um, so that starts falling away as an issue where you have to calculate all these complicated media query breakpoint situations. Um, that auto flow dense uh, feature named areas and throwing in the, into the mix the order property, you can start really messing with visual ordering of your content. So um, that example where I had named areas, headers in the header, but if I say, hey, header content, go to the footer, and I say, let's get rid of the overlay, and I say, hey, footer content, go to the header, it'll do that for me, right? Which, that's kind of crazy. It used to take a lot of, you know, like jQuery append around or something. There are just other ways of doing that that we're used to, but um, there are these features now that allow us to move things around on the page, but you should just be really mindful of accessibility especially when people are trying to tab through the content. If you're throwing off the source order and the visual order, that stuff starts to get muddy. So I would use it sparingly and when the logical ordering really doesn't matter. Um, so that's just confused it. confused if the markup doesn't match what the CSS is doing. Yeah, it's not like the screen reader reads the markup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. The markup doesn't match what you're visually seeing. Mm -hmm. Was yeah, the, the comment was so would um, the, so yeah the visual ordering and the source order are and when you use these properties the source order doesn't get affected so if a screen reader goes through the content it's relying just on the source order um, so that's why you want to be careful using those it's sort of like a great power comes great responsibility thing um, using like icon just for presentation purposes? Yeah. Screen not going to read it. So presentation purposes it. only stuff. You can move around the page um, without worrying about that too much. Some of these properties can be animated. Uh, that's, um, so I'm just toggling a class with like one line of JavaScript, and that gap is animated. That's how would you have done that before? <laughs> well, you just spent all day on that, or some. I don't know. Maybe if you're, it, it's just really straightforward now. All this has is display grid, um, repeat to one fr grid gap has a transition on it. Just goes from one gap value to another gap value based on a class. Uh, template columns, template rows, that same thing. You can animate that stuff. Would that work on a hover? Probably, yeah. Could you move if that would work on a hover from one section to another in the same way? Huh? 
Can you move content from one section to another in the same I way? I bet you could. I haven't played with the animation aspect very much, but I bet you could move uh, content around a little bit. I, if, and more of these features will be developed over time. I think animation, uh, that's still in progress. Um, we'll get more properties as the specifications develop so that you can animate. But I know that these three you can animate right now. Uh, let's see. So where does this leave Flexbox? That's a good question. Um, in general, so sort of paraphrasing uh, Miriam, who gave a wonderful workshop on advanced CSS that I went to in April. Uh, Flexbox, you, it's not strictly for one-dimensional layouts and Grid is for two-dimensional layouts. You can think about it a little bit more um, loosely than that. So Flexbox is when you want things to be sharing, smart about sharing space in a dimension X or Y, right? Grid is when you want to have things share, uh, take up space in a smart way on either dimension, but you want them to adhere to a layout. So uh, Flexbox is good for certain things and you're still going to want to use it, uh, especially when you have unknown number of items and you don't care about how they respond to the items in rows above them, things can just wrap. Flexbox is great for, you know, you can play with the width property on a flex item. So flex is on the bottom, grid's on the top. You can start to make it look like grid but it gets a little messy. Flexbox is really great for stuff like that where you want the five and six to take up the remaining space on the row it landed on. Uh, Grid's great for having that six and two line up perfectly every time. That was the first use case I ran into with Grid where I was like, wow, I really need those hanging last items to line up with the stuff above them. Grid's great for that. Just really simple, easy CSS to write and it just works. Right now, some things that Grid can do that Flexbox can't. Intentional overlapping of items, Grid's really great for lining things up with stuff in another dimension, like I was just saying. Also, Gap, so Grid Gap is gonna become Gap, and it is coming to Flexbox. Uh, I think that exists in Firefox and maybe a version that's gonna ship soon, but that will come, so we will have Gap in Flexbox at some point. Right now, it's just in Grid. But like Rachel Andrew says in a great talk I watched, uh, you don't need a grid-shaped hammer for every layout task. Uh, it doesn't replace flexbox, multi-column, floats, uh, but you can start using those things for more of like, their intended purposes. Uh, and because CSS is developing with backwards compatibility always in mind, you don't have to be afraid of using older layout uh, techniques. You can nest flexbox inside of a grid. Uh, you can do all kinds of things to make interesting layouts. So, and I think the biggest reason people aren't using it, besides, so there's kind of like developer overwhelm, where you're like, oh God, I gotta learn this new thing. And it looks really complicated at first. There are all those properties I ran through quickly. Um, but another big reason, so that's one whole issue in its own. Syntax, the podcast just did a great um, show last week on doing the things that make you feel uncomfortable on purpose to grow as a developer and how important that is in our industry. Uh, but browser support, so this has been out for two years. It's supported in all major browsers. Uh, people should be using it, but why aren't they? Probably this, that IE11 being yellowish, right? Is That's probably the, one of the big reasons. Um, but sort of, it's sort of a flawed way of thinking about it where you're letting one browser that's never going to update hold you back forever. You can't really, that's, CSS doesn't really work like that anyway. It's really a set of suggestions that you can't control ultimately what the, what the user gets at the end of the day based on their connection, the viewport, uh, just there are all kinds of conditions that actually control what you see at the end of the day. And you should just be writing CSS that works in a, like graceful degradation way, like progressively enhanced, you know, those terms people throw around a lot now. Um, so with IE11, there's, um, it does have an older version of the specification. Rachel Andrew has a whole blog post about should I be using that older version of the specification. It actually shipped good first. Um, 
it's just never going to get the new specification. You can, with auto prefixer, turn a, the MS prefixes on. And I've played with it a little bit. It's not on by default because it doesn't work perfectly. It's not going to just make your grid instantly work in IE 11. Um, but honestly, when I've used it, it's gotten me really far. I just shipped a project to production that I had, when I turned gr auto prefixer grid on, um, it, I had to write one line in the CSS that then made all my grids work in IE 11 for that site. <laughs> so use it with caution. Um, it's not going to solve all your problems. It's not designed to. But it might get you pretty far in a lot of cases. Um, and I didn't even have to use at supports, but that's another option. You can layer in at supports to, if it supports grid, have a grid layout. Um, I think a lot of people, are, I know at my company there was a fear that if we use grid, we have to write two layouts now all of a sudden for everything. I have to write the grid version and the flex version. It's doubling my work, and it's going to take twice as long. And, um, but I think, um, and I've heard people say, once you get using grid, you're writing a layout so fast, like so quickly that, and easily that works, that you kind of don't mind writing a couple, sprinkling in a couple fallbacks for browsers that might not support it or in cases where the user doesn't get the grid. Um, so I, I think if you just start playing with grid, you're going to feel a lot more comfortable using it, and IE 11 is going to seem less of a, a fear. Um, so almost, oh, we're really good on time, actually. Um, I was going to show an example of what's coming soon is subgrid, um, but uh, there's plenty more to talk about. But um, So when you, Firefox Nightly now has subgrid, and you can play with it. It's when, so you have a grid, you can nest grids inside of it to get child items to sort of look like they adhere to the parent grid. But at the end of the day, they don't. Their content will not affect the tracks of the uh, parent grid. So basically what you can do is you can take the definition of your rows and columns from a parent grid container and have the child inherit those properties. Uh, there are some, there's a great talk Rachel Andrew just released last week, I think, that's called Hello Subgrid. I have a link to it um, where she goes into a lot of the great use cases for this. It's kind of hard to imagine great use cases for it, but like one example is cards. This is the most popular example out there right now. Whereas if, you know, a designer hands you a layout that looks like this, where the say those are headers, and then you have like body text, and then you have little footers on these cards. Maybe there's an image inside each one. They line up great because the content fits. It's not too long, but if you make one of those have um, longer content, they don't line up anymore. If I open this in Firefox Nightly, which I have, I can show anybody after, just save a little time right now on it, they'll line up. If you apply subgrid, it will inherit the template, columns, template rows of the parent. So that's going to be really cool. Um, that is, so it's just another value for grid template columns, grid template rows, basically. Um, there are some features of it. Rachel Andrew does a much better job talking about it, um, but just some notes here on uh, what happens when you inherit uh, line numbers start from one. They don't take the number of the parent, um, stuff like that. One cool thing she talks about is you couldn't, so you could only use that negative one trick to get to the end of an explicit grid. But if the browser has created some columns for you, it won't go to the end of the page, you know, it won't go all the way to the edge of the viewport. It can only be accessed with negative one on the explicit lines. With subgrid, there are techniques to now be able to make something stretch. Like if you have a bunch of rows that are getting created implicitly, you could have the first item fill the whole column and go to the bottom of your rows. You can't do that right now. So some fun stuff coming. Um, this still in development. Um, it's Highly encouraged to play around with it and file any bugs you find with it or new use cases for it. Um, there is an issue queue for the CSS working group. Uh, it's, you know, right on GitHub. You can 
contribute to this spec uh, once, because once it's released, you know, that's the way it's going to work. So, um, what gets really exciting with this is so another thing like Jen Simmons talks a lot about too is uh, with responsive design, um, we had there's there are these little dialogues happening all over where a designer would say, "Hey, I have this great idea for a layout." And a developer was like, eh, that's great, but we probably can't do that within budget and within reason. We'd have to do all kinds of crazy things to make your content adhere to that layout. Um, she envisions a great future where we start being able to play with crazy new layout ideas that it's, you shouldn't be pulling these things off the shelf and have every website look the same. Um, cool things you can play with, like overlap. Uh, this is really easy to do, and you can play with opacity and z-index on your grid items. If they're spanning into the same area, they'll overlap, and you could do all kinds of interesting stuff with that. You can leave negative space now um, in a really straightforward way. That, um, like, I just did a layout where the content has a sidebar, content, and sidebar. But looking more closely at the design, they weren't evenly distributed. I was like, oh, there's a fourth column, but it's empty and was able to lay out, you know, according much more to the designer's vision what they actually wanted than was being done with, I took the flex box that was originally written for it out and put grid in, and now they have the layout they were actually after. Thank you. You're welcome, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> um, playing with viewport units on your grid, that could do some fun stuff, and especially playing with the bottom edge of the screen. Um, and playing with that, uh, those values that aren't fixed, but mixing mi uh, fixed and flexible values as needed can get really fun. Um, there are neat little things like, I see I have a fixed pixel unit, an FR, a min max, and a min max. These, with previous um, ways of coding this, they would all s get smaller and grow uh, at the same time. But if you notice, 2 is getting smaller because it has an FR unit. And then the min-maxes will start to go, the 3 and the 4, once the 2 runs out of space. So just another interesting feature that this brought to the table that people should go nuts with and see what you can do to make things more interesting for your users. Um, especially, um, you can have the layout uh, with playing with... Um, those flexible values and um, <coughs> negative space, you can create really interesting effects as you scroll down a page. Uh, there are just a lot of good ideas now that are just easier to implement with accessible semantic markup and without intervening with a lot of JavaScript, for example. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I have a lot of resources here. This talk is, so I'm cost LFX on pretty much everything, and GitLab cost LFX talks, the Intro to Grid branch has this talk, CodePen cost LFX has a collection that's all the examples in this talk, and then a bunch of resources that I recommend. Uh, Jen Simmons has a Layoutland YouTube channel that explains a lot of good stuff, like most common mistakes made in Grid, um, or how to um, use Flexbox and Grid together, all kinds of fun stuff. Her experimental layout lab is a great website where she's just been taking uh, really interesting layouts from print design mostly and applying them to the web and making them responsive in cool ways. So you can sort of see what's uh, out there. Um, I think that, so here's Rachel Andrews' new talk, Hello Subgrid, that explains what that does in a lot better detail. Um, there's that syntax episode uh, make yourself uncomfortable to grow, which I recommend um, pretty highly. So some good resources and some, some stuff about um, why we should probably be using this tool more. Um, I hope that somebody got some useful stuff out of this that you'll be more comfortable using Grid and see sort of how the possibilities unfold from here. Um, it should uh, make you excited about CSS. It made me more excited about CSS. So anyway, thanks, guys. Any questions?
No expert, but I will answer some questions. <laughs> yeah, sure. Have you used the um, auto place for auto prefixer? No, I haven't. Have I used auto place without a prefixer? Yeah, I just used it last week, and it actually cool. in IE 11 it will put the things in the right places and put the gap. Yeah, awesome. So that will help out with IE 11, is what he says. You can do it in IE 11. Put things where to be. Cool. So it helps with the auto placement algorithm in IE11? Well, it won't do the auto placement, but it will. Okay. If you say you want this thing in the top left and this thing in the top right, you can get that to work in IE11. Okay. All right. Cool. So actual placement. Okay. Yep. Um, do you know what grid is basically the solution for you know, layouts and everything? Uh, or is there something else in the horizon that is going to be seen? Um, I don't Can see. The yeah, so do I see grid being sort of the end all be all solution to our layout problems? And will there be something better that comes along? Um, this is a standard in CSS, and I think that we should um, respect that. Like, that things don't become a standard in CSS that easily or quickly. And, uh, you know, this is a native to CSS, it's core, it, it just works. Um, I don't see a lot of other things making this obsolete anytime soon. So, yep. Um, I don't know if you know anything about this, but there's the, um, there's a new set of units coming out that are not um, like vertical and horizontal, but based on the next direction. And I haven't like heard the writing about. mode stuff, or yeah. yeah. So instead of using VH and the, um, um, yeah, um, it's going to be based on how, what your rule is around where the text is being read from, left to right or bottom, top to bottom. Yeah, 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 that stuff is definitely going to play nicely with but are grid. are they actually going to be writing to each other? So you make a rule that says text correction. Yeah, I haven't played too. Yeah, so it's just so it's discussing new units in CSS that um, will work with writing modes and how that plays with grid. I think um, there are great examples on Jen Simmons' layout lab. So this is playing with writing modes and grid. Um, it's um, there are a lot of examples here that involve writing modes, and um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. I haven't played with it a lot myself. Hope to. So. But she's still using the VM and VH. Uh, probably in some cases. I'd have to inspect a few of these ones, but. Um, I only just heard about this, so I'm just wondering if you had heard more because it just. Yeah, just a little <clears throat> bit, but not a lot. So. Yep. So I'm trying to reconcile the sort of grids and nested grids and component base. Like, does nesting grids generally work fine if you use like the holy grail like content and sidebars, but then inside of your header you have another layout that you want in grid? Is that kosher? Yeah. Yeah. So he's asking about nesting grids, and um, I know I know we have been burned in the past by nested flexbox. Um, being buggy, but um, I think a lot of work went into this specification before it went into um, uh, production um, prime time browser support land. So um, I, it's pretty reliable from what I've seen. I haven't tried nesting many, many grids, but at least two levels, pretty reliable. Um, and I do encourage people to use it not just for whole page layouts, but for individual components. Laying out things inside of your components is a really great use for a grid. Yep. I wondered if anybody here has used CSS grid creators. It's like a gamification. Of yeah, that, yeah, I, I haven't used it, but I think those are great games that help you learn grid. Mm -hmm. um, there have, you know, there were ones for Flexbox that were really great, and there are ones for grid that are really great. He suggested CSS grid critters as one. Um, 
yeah, so you can, if you learn better that way, that's a great uh, resource. Yep. Seems like if you're setting up uh, using CSS Grid that you'd have less reason to use paragraphs. So do you have any thoughts as to, is that something that just puts more of that into the designer? Or would you use paragraphs with something like this? Like paragraphs the Drupal module? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I would. Yeah, so he's asking about using Grid with the Paragraphs module in Drupal. Um, so that's a great example of where I would use it on a component level. Um, if you have, um, you know, you want three items where you have two at the top and one to span the bottom within a paragraph, I would use Grid for that. I maybe wouldn't use Grid to lay out my paragraphs on the page, but. Uh, per paragraph, I think it would be really useful to use Grid. It would cut down any kind of custom paragraphs that you have to make. Yeah, someone suggested that it would cut down on custom paragraph creation. So, mm -hmm. Cool. All right, thanks, guys. I'll be around.